and energy that he's put into this presentation. Uh, we all know Ali, so I don't think I need to go into his background, but really just wanted to let the team know that this has been, uh, you know, he, he has put a lot of um, work into this presentation, and we thank him very, very much for it. Um, Ali, do you want to go ahead and get started then? Sure. Uh, you know, wanted to first of all welcome everybody um, to today's presentation, and thank you for for joining us. Um, can everybody hear me very well? I'm hoping so. If there are any questions as we're going through, please feel free to either type them or uh, to unmute your microphone and ask the question directly. Uh, so today's presentation is on vestibular rehabilitation. Um, and we'll be looking at, uh, as Mr. Mina mentioned via WhatsApp, uh, we'll be looking at the office exam. Uh, we'll be covering some of the material that was in the MedBridge presentation, and that's why I, uh, Nishi sent out the uh, PowerPoint slides um, uh, yesterday. So if you can, perhaps on, on one screen in your office somehow, uh, pull up those slides as well as the PowerPoint presentation. If not, then we'll We'll try and switch back and forth uh, between the PowerPoint presentation and uh, some of the information in the handout. Okay, so we'll go to the first slide. Okay, so we are looking at uh, this is the, the presentation overview, and uh, and the information in here essentially uh, is the 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 majority of what we'll be talking about uh, today. So we'll be going through a lot of the, the definitions of these terms. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much of the presentation that everybody's been able to get through. I saw that uh, Dar Salaam uh, only saw a portion of this, so uh, I'm assuming that uh, Mombasa and Nairobi got through a little bit more of the presentation. Uh, but uh, we'll be we'll be using this as background information. So starting off with saccades, uh, the term saccades is is, uh, is one that's used particularly in vestibular rehabilitation. Um, wondering, are we able to make this a bit of a of a conversation, or is it because of the microphones? You think that will issue? You think that we'll be unable to to do so? I think we go ahead and give it a try and see how it goes. Um, oh. Let's try and make it more of a, so if folks can unmute when they're ready to speak, that would be great. Okay. So any, uh, does anybody want to uh, chime in and give us a definition of security at all? Mr. Mana, do you think you might be able to? Or I can just continue on. You know, earlier, Mina had sent a message saying that they're still having trouble connecting their microphone, but I wonder yes. if the others, if anybody from Mombasa or Dark, and uh, even you can even just type it in if you like, if you can't, uh, if the mic's not working. Oh, here we go. So my, the mic in Nairobi is not working. Um, so for, for everybody's information, then, saccades help us to... Uh, refocus the eye uh, during, uh, and then this was in the presentation uh, by Medbridge, but uh, saccades essentially help us to refocus our eyes during movement, and there are quick, rapid eye movements which help us uh, to refocus or bring the center um, of an object into uh, the center of our eye. So, uh, so saccades are essentially noticed during pursuit of an object. Now, when you're looking at an object moving across your field of vision, if it's faster than your eye is able to process the information, then the eye will essentially skip over some of the information being presented, and that's a jump, uh, also known as the saccade. Okay. All right. So the next term we look at is smooth pursuit, which I just mentioned there. So smooth pursuit is uh, the ability of the eyes, again, to follow a moving object. And um, the way we test smooth pursuit is through the use of uh, uh, just basically looking at an object and asking the patient to follow uh, the object with their eyes. Um, so in smooth pursuit, for example, we can use the pencil tip 
or the tip of uh, any examination tool and uh, attempt to, to have the patient follow that. Um, the, a common method of doing this um, assessment is by having the patient seated uh, and the examiner will essentially be one arm's length away from the patient. Um, the examiner will be holding, let's say if it's a pencil, and instruct the patient to stare at the tip of the pencil and then it's moved either horizontally or vertically um, in order to track the smooth pursuit of the individual. Okay, HVOR. HVOR stands for Horizontal Vestibulo-Ocular Reflex and uh, there are various ways to test this and we'll be going through um, during, uh, during the presentation. Head thrust as well um, is an excellent uh, method to be able to test uh, nystagmus and gaze stabilization after rotation and so we'll be looking at that. Uh, DVA is dynamic visual acuity and that's where you would be sitting a patient in front of an eye chart. Uh, some people call it a Snellen chart but it's the eye chart with, uh, which has the various letters which we've all seen before which helps test our vision um, and essentially you have the, the patient turn their head side to side while looking at the chart. Um, you have them identify which level of the chart they're able to accurately see uh, with their head still and then have them move their head side to side and then at that point they'll indicate which level they're able to accurately see. Um, if it's more than one level uh, that the patient has to move up then that's considered um, a deficit and needs to be noted. Uh, VOR suppression and so we need the ability to either have, as we're turning our head, uh, we need the ability to either keep our eyes on a particular object as we turn our head or we need the ability to have our eyes move with our skull as we turn our head, you know, depending upon the situation. That's where the VOR suppression comes in. Positional dizziness, I think, uh, you know, that's kind of self-explanatory as far as if we put ourselves in a particular position, uh, do we get dizzy and what causes that dizziness? We'll be looking at um, the right hall pike, left hall pike, those are biasing particular um, semicircular canals in the vestibular system and uh, we'll be looking at those. Obviously that's uh, one of the more fun and more interesting things that we do on a vestibular uh, rehab basis and so we'll be looking closely at the hall pike maneuver. The roll test also biases the horizontal canals, uh, the horizontal semicircular canals in the vestibular system and it's very similar to the hall pike uh, although those are for either uh, the anterior or posterior semicircular canals. Uh, sensory organization uh, is essentially the ability of a patient to take in all of the information pertaining to balance. So balance is a meta system. It's a system comprised of three other systems. Okay. Uh, so balance is comprised of vision, strength, and sensation. So sensory organization is the ability to integrate all of these pieces of information to keep yourself upright. Um, and so we've all done this before where we've had our patient be together, eyes open, eyes closed. Uh, they could be standing on a surface, eyes open, eyes closed. And so that all is uh, sensory organization and essentially leads to biasing our testing to determine exactly what area um, is the deficit and what's the problem um, with regards to uh, sensory integration and organization. Uh, dynamic balance for the utricle, saccule, horizontal canals, and anterior posterior canals essentially combines head movement um, with walking. So far so good. Everybody okay? That's the examination piece and of course this is just an overview. Okay, so we'll be getting uh, more into this and we can refer back to the slide. Um, as well, if there's any questions or as we're moving through. Okay, 
so then in the treatment side, we have the early treatment and we have late treatment. That essentially um, uh, leads to either you know, acute or chronic treatment. Um, and of course, these are in response to our assessments, and we use our assessments to help them determine exactly what's going on. So uh, these are some of the biggest or greatest deficits that we see um, from a vestibular standpoint. And so the, the, there's a reason that unilateral hypofunction is highlighted, and we don't necessarily see bilateral um, uh, rolled in with the, the unilateral or, or there's, there's, on a bilateral basis, you don't really see a hypofunction. Uh, you'll see a bilateral loss, per se. Um, and that is because if, for example, on both sides of your ear, if one side is providing a little bit less sensation or less hearing or less vestibular input compared to the other, that's when you have an imbalance. Um, if you have both of them on both sides, which are essentially have the same level of loss, then to an extent you have a bit of balance. Um, and, uh, and that doesn't necessarily cause any clinically observable uh, symptoms. So on the unilateral hypofunction loss, we have decreased vestibular ocular reflex gain on the horizontal and vertical sides. Uh, we have some impaired standing and dynamic standing balance. Uh, on the dynamic side, we're looking at how that balance is affected by the utricle or saccule horizontal or anterior or posterior semicircular canals. Um, and then a visual preference for, um, for positional motion sensitivity. So later on, uh, down the line, if it's been a little while since the patient has suffered either an injury or exposure to a virus which may have caused the Meniere's disease, um, or we may have had a dislodging of uh, the calcium carbonate crystals, uh, which would cause uh, BP which we'll get into a little bit, um, then you would have uh, a unilateral hypofunction, uh, more of a chronic phase. And um, again, you would have decreased VOR gain and um, the impaired static and dynamic standing balances. Uh, so the rest of it, take a quick glance. But we'll move on to the next slide if you want. examination and diagnosis notes. So vestibular rehab, vestibular uh, rehabilitation essentially promotes uh, central nervous system adaptation for impairment in peripheral receptors, which is behavioral compensation uh, if appropriate for the loss of the bilateral loss. So but we're attempting to reprogram the brain and use a term called synaptic plasticity or neuroplasticity to adjust the inner parts of the brain to sometimes make up for any input loss. So, um, if, for example, if you're an individual who's having less vestibular input from one ear, um, that might be throwing you off a little bit, then the goal is to be able to come to see your therapist who will teach you various activities which would help to neutralize um, some of that uh, imbalance and teach your brain to make up for or uh, control the lack of input from a particular area. And that's essentially the basis of, uh, of what we're trying to do. So gain, let's talk about gain. Uh, gain is the velocity of eye rotation. Um, and if it matches the velocity of your head rotation, then gain, gain is equal to minus one. So, um, if your gain is less than minus one, it indicates a retinal slip and requires recalibration of the vestibular ocular reflex, which constantly occurs. Uh, the stagmus, as eyes, and we cover this a little, very little bit, as the eyes travel to the limits of their range, they will snap back to mid position. The stagmus is named for snap back fast towards the strong eye. Um, and eyes will drift to the weak side. So there's a resting impulse frequency between right and left vestibular nerves, um, and the canal being turned to becomes excited. The canal being turned away from uh, decreases activity. And we'll be looking at this closely during the exam portion. 
uh, utricle. The utricle lies horizontally in the air and detects motion in the horizontal plane, while the saccule is oriented vertically and detects motion in the sagittal plane, up and down, forward and back. So if you stand up, sit down, or if you look up, look down. So the way I usually try and remember this is um, that the, the utricle has the U, and even though that might usually tell us up, down, in this case it's horizontal. So it, the U speaks to us being uh, biasing the, the uh, horizontal movements in the air. Uh, BPPV. So BPPV is a uh, dizziness that's generally thought to be due to debris which is collected within a part of the inner ear. Uh, this, this debris can be thought of as ear rock, uh, although the formal name is autoconia. These autoconia are uh, essentially calcium carbonate crystals, and uh, they may get dislodged um, from the utricle or saccule and cause irritation. And, and in fact, it can happen in any of the semicircular canals as well. Um, it will cause irritation. Um, and make you feel like you're moving when you're really not. So if we're looking, for example, at, uh, at the, the PowerPoint slides, a great picture would be on page 13 of page out of 159. In addition, uh, we'll, we'll look at a nice uh, anatomical image, I believe, on the next slide. So uh, the cupula, before we go on to the uh, next slide, sorry. Uh, so the cupula is a structure um, in the uh, vestibular system providing a sense of spatial orientation. The cupula is located within the ampullae of each of the three semicircular canals. Um, so the ampullae are the broad sections towards the base of each semicircular canal. Um, and again, we'll be able to look at that uh, in, in the next slide or on page 13 of 159 on the PowerPoint presentation um, from Medbridge. So the, the, um, each semicircular canal has its own particular ampullae and uh, as part of the crista ampullaris, the cupula has embedded within it hair cells um, that have several even smaller hair cells or stereocilia. So the cupula itself is a gelatinous component of the crista ampullaris that extends from the cristae to the roof of the ampullae. So that's, uh, we can go to the, the next slide. A bit of a um, might be a bit of a picture here on to, to be able to take a look at, um, and so the uh, quick explanation for that is that in this broadening section or the the base the ampullae of each semicircular canal, uh, once you open that up, then you'll be able to see on the on microscopic level that these hairs, so these hairs are running vertically in each of the base of each of these semicircular canals, and there's a gel within there, and if that gel is disturbed then it disturbs the hairs, and the hairs then send the signal to your brain to say that, um, that this has been disturbed or we're moving in this direction. Okay. Um, so looking at uh, figure one, anatomy of the outer ear all the way to the inner ear, uh, we have uh, three semicircular canals which sense rotation of the head. Uh, so we have horizontal anterior and posterior. Uh, each canal plane is perpendicular to the other planes, and each canal on one side of the head works with the same plane canal on the opposite side of the head in a push-pull relationship. So what that means is a push-pull is that, for example, if I'm turn my, I turn my head to the right, everybody turn your head to the right, your right side of your vestibular system is receiving more input and in fact, your brain is actually shutting down the input coming in from the left side. Um, so although even though the left side is being stimulated less while turning right, um, your brain is, is increasing the difference of input by actually muting um, the level of information coming from the opposite side. So that's your quote-unquote push-pull relationship. There's a quick note here on the uh, the muscles used the medial and lateral rectus uh, in the eye, and so we know that those pull the eyes side to side and help us um, essentially look side to side. So the way you want to test uh, the horizontal canal 
is or sorry, is to bend your head or flex your head by 30 degrees and then rotate it. So you'll notice that a lot of times uh, if we're biasing the horizontal canal and in the horizontal vestibular ocular reflex, we'll be flexing our head 30 degrees and rotating. Um, and then uh, the anterior and posterior uh, semicircular canals, you can bias them at the same time by nodding, yes, uh, by nodding your head up and down. Uh, on to the next slide. Mr. Mayan, I see, I see that uh, you mentioned my microphone keeps fluctuating. Is uh, is this better? If you can, just send a note and say this is better. I'm trying to uh, position my mic clearly for everybody. Okay. Um, so the next slide is, uh, and thanks um, for changing the slide. So the next slide is a much uh, more focused and clear uh, image of the semicircular canal and its various pieces. And so this gives us a clearer idea of what I was trying to explain with the ampulla at the base of each semicircular canal and the, uh, the hairs which are essentially vertically placed within that semicircular canal. And so I'll just go ahead and read the description here. So when the head rotates, the ampulla filling the semicircular duct initially lags behind due to inertia. So what does that mean? It means there's, if there's a cup of water um, and it's sitting in front of you, if you were to snatch it up uh, or, or snatch it side to side, the water would essentially stay in the same place for a very brief moment while the cup is moving. And that's what causes the water to spill because the water is in the same place the cup is moved, the water spills over the edge. So imagine a cup of water sitting on a table. You come along and uh, from the right-hand side and swipe it towards the left. Uh, the water will, I wish I could have a uh, you know, contribution for everybody, but uh, the water will slide off to the right. You're coming, you're coming in from the right and using your right hand to swipe the glass over to the left. The water will pour over to the right. Um, so continuing on here, then as a result, the cupula is deflected opposite the direction of head movement, just like the water would be in my example. Um, as the endolymph pushes the cupula, the stereocilia is bent as well, stimulating the hair cells within prisma ambularis. After a short time of continual rotation, however, so if, for example, we decide we're going to make ourselves dizzy, and we're going to turn around in the, in the circle, or turn around in a five circle. So in this case, the endolymph's acceleration normalizes uh, with the rate of rotation of the semicircular duct. So as a result, the cupula returns to its resting position, the hair cells cease to be stimulated. So you'll notice, for example, uh, if you're turning around in the circle, eventually your eyes adjust to uh, the fact that you are turning in a circle. And you're not going to feel dizzy while you're turning. You wouldn't feel dizzy until you stop turning. So the hair cells cease to, so um, the cupula returns to its resting position and the hair cells cease to be stimulated. So this continues until the head stops rotating, which simultaneously halts semicircular duct rotation. Due to inertia, however, the endolymph continues on. As the endolymph continues to move, the cupula is once again deflected, resulting in the compensatory movement of the body with one. In each of these situations, as fluid rushes by the cupula, the hair cells stimulated transmit corresponding signal to the brain to the vestibulo-ocular uh, vestibulo nerve, uh, which is uh, number eight. We'll go to the next slide. All right. So, looking at the history of the of the dizzy patient. Uh, so, there is a lot of uh, of information that we're going to uh, try and gain from the patient with regards to the dizziness, uh, just because it's uh, it's one of the most important areas of examination. So, we usually do try and, and begin here. Uh, so, uh, the history of, uh, of the uh, dizzy patient is fr frequently more important than the actual examination. Um, for example, one can usually easily spot BPVV through history um, in about 20% of dizzy patients, and I'll, I'll explain that a little further. Uh, so, you want to 
start off by uh, talking about the business. And so if you want to make notes as we're chatting along, you, you some, we often ask about the type of dizziness. And people often mention that um, the, the type of dizziness is the least reliable feature of an exam. Where if you ask, ah, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel um, you know, dizzy? That you, you need to you 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 might feel nauseous. Can you not maintain your balance? And so these are all kind of in specific methods of um, of trying to determine what's going on. And so the type of dizziness is is not very reliable as a good question, but um, good questions to ask. And this is not on the PowerPoint slide. This is uh, in the We're looking at I'll give you the exact page. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to find the, the dizziness page, but if I'll, I'll continue on. So, um, dizziness history. You're looking at spontaneous versus motion induced. So, you know, this there's a, a very nice um, flow sheet or or of dizziness testing and dizziness questions, and that is on page 45. And in fact, the, the uh, slide that I'm looking at is page 44. Okay, so we have a wonderful history algorithm for the dizzy patient. So we're going to start off looking at the uh, spontaneous versus motion induced. That tells us a big um, cause of dizziness. So, for example, if it's spontaneous. Um, and it might have to do with either diminished vestibular input, secondary to Meniere's disease, or um, any sort of quote unquote poisoning by medication, um, uh, any other virus. There's lots of different causes for spontaneous uh, out of dizziness. Motion induced would then speak to either biasing um, any part of the vestibular system, or it might also have to do with uh, blood pressure and orthostatic changes of position. Uh, we're going to look at duration of dizziness, frequency of dizziness, uh, provocative factors, auditory complaints, falls, and uh, and lightheaded versus imbalanced versus vertigo. So this brings us to um, our algorithm, which is on page again 45. And so we look on the left-hand side, and we see there are three major questions here: lightheaded, imbalanced, and vertigo. Okay. Um, and we're able to kind of move through each decision-making process. So if somebody's feeling lightheaded, oftentimes they're able to describe what lightheaded feels like as if there's not enough blood rushing to their brain. Uh, they might even sometimes feel short of breath. Um, and so lightheadedness would then lead us to look at or testing uh, orthostatic changes of position versus spontaneous dizziness or lightheadedness. And so if it's spontaneous lightheadedness, uh, then we're looking at a cardiac arrhythmia. Um, if it has to do with orthostatic changes of position, um, this would be another instance where I would ask, what does what exactly does orthostatic changes of position mean? But um, it essentially means when you change your body position, how does your body's blood pressure and uh, the ability to circulate blood through your body change with regards to position? So I thought the, the, one of the most common terms is orthostatic hypotension. Um, and that is essentially when we are sitting down and we stand up, uh, the heart is essentially not pumping enough blood up to the brain, um, and we feel slightly lightheaded. Um, and we might feel dizzy at that point. Uh, so there are a few causes of orthostatic hypotension, one being dehydration, could be an adverse effect of a cardiovascular medication or a cardiac dysfunction. Okay, and now how about imbalanced? Uh, imbalance is uh, a way to help define that is the patient's inability to maintain a steady balance in a particular position. Uh, and we look at uh, a few different causes of this imbalance, whether it's head motion induced, whether it's persistent with a gait or your position or positional complaint. Uh, if, for example, somebody's feeling imbalanced and you look at uh, uh, or you ask them to see, uh, was this brought on? Um, by any head motions, uh, then you're looking at it possibly speaking to either uh, a bilateral vestibular loss or an acoustic neuroma, or you're looking at it being associated with a dysarthria, 
This factor is the inability to properly form sounds. Diplopia is double vision, headache, or limb coordination. Um, and that all leads us to thinking of uh, possibly a central nervous system disorder. Uh, if we're looking at imbalance in, uh, tied in with uh, changes in gait, and you want to go to a system screen, and you want to consider possibly a non-vestibular cause of this imbalance, which might be a, cere a cerebellar lesion or sensory loss, secondary to uh, uh, vestibular nerve neuropathy or vestibular ocular nerve neuropathy, uh, vision loss, or weakness. And this speaks to how I, when I was explaining earlier that uh, uh, balance is essentially a metasystem comprised of, of three subsystems. Um, positional complaints. Uh, positional complaints are either leading towards somebody feeling imbalanced or a vertigo. Okay. Um, and within vertigo, you have three subcategories you can add, or, or three sub causes. Uh, one would be positional, other would be spontaneous, and then the third would be induced by sound or pressure. If we've ever been in a position where we've had a very loud sound, so loud that it makes us dizzy. Uh, that is actually a biomechanical uh, response to that sound. And it's a essentially it's a deflection of uh, the gel-like endolymph in the, uh, in the inner ear caused by that uh, very formidable vibration or loud sound. So when uh, somebody has vertigo, we're looking at uh, positional complaints and we'll look at whether uh, that uh, if, when the person is in that position for either a minute or less, we're looking to see the dizziness. So if they are um, in a position for less than a minute and the vertigo subsides, then we're looking at uh, the cause possibly either being BPPV, uh, migraine-related dizziness, uh, vestibular paroxysmia, or a phobic positional vertigo. And so that means that the person is essentially afraid of, of being in that position and then the fear fades away. If the dizziness lasts for more than one minute in any particular position, uh, then we're looking at a vestibular paroxysmia or uh, associated with migraine. Uh, we're looking at a different type of BPPV called cupulolithiasis where um, essentially the, the autoconia or the calcium carbonate crystals are stuck and not moving. And we can get into that a little bit further. Um, and then again, the uh, phobic positional vertigo. So the rest of this um, uh, algorithm is still needs to be explained. I hope we're all following along and we've been able to, to find this algorithm. So now we're looking at uh, spontaneous onset of vertigo. Um, if it's persistent for more than one week, we're thinking that it might not have to do with the ear. Um, if we see that that dizziness lasts and is spontaneous and it comes on for uh, hours or days, we're looking at hearing loss and we're thinking of either um, Meniere's disease and, or a labyrinthitis, which is an inflammation of the um, inner ear or the cochlea. Uh, if, if it's for minutes or seconds, we're looking at uh, a history with regard to migraine headaches and or uh, you know, changing of inputs, as mentioned, uh, light, sound, odor sensitivity, uh, etc. Obviously, there's uh, the risk of a stroke, and so you want to keep an eye on that as well. Uh, when you're taking your history, uh, that would obviously speak to diminished vestibular function from the side that's been affected. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, if your vertigo is caused or induced by sound or pressure, uh, then you're looking at, uh, and, and if that dizziness lasts, then we're looking at some damage in the inner ear or the middle ear. And uh, we, that needs to be addressed. And so we're looking at either a superior canal dehiscence. And that's essentially where the, the superior, or also known as the anterior canal, uh, uh, might actually crack off a little bit. Or you might have a little bit of a leakage in there of that endolymph. Um, and, and that's in response to a loud noise or, or, or serious amount of pressure. Uh, or a perilymphatic fistula. And a fistula is a little tube, which again allows for leakage. All right, so that uh, is essentially our, our dizziness algorithm. Um, and in there, you know, we talked a lot about uh, different causes of dizziness and ways to kind of determine 
sense of what's been going on. But to, to clear it up a little bit, um, you know, from a macro level, you essentially want to look to see is the patient lightheaded, imbalanced, or presenting with vertigo, and then when was that dizziness uh, uh, caused or started? How long has that patient been dizzy for? Um, and what causes that dizziness? What causes it to go away? Uh, so and some definitions here. Vertigo um, is caused by a nystagmus, and there's different types of nystagmus which we'll be getting into. Um, oscillopsia is a retinal slit. That's when you're staring at something and you're unable to um, to stay focused or keep the center of that, that image on the center of your eye. Um, there's ataxia or confusion, which may lead to dizziness, and then orthostatic hypertension. So timing of dizziness, and so we talked about this a little bit, but just as a quick review, so BPPV lasts for seconds. A TIA or dizziness related to a TIA lasts for minutes. Meniere's disease, which is a virus which affects the vestibular system particularly and can cause damage or long-term damage on the unilateral side or on one side more than another. The dizziness will be for hours or it may come and go on a spontaneous basis. Vestibular neuronitis, which is an inflammation there, uh, the dizziness will last for days. And ototoxins like medications, uh, substance abuse, alcohol, things like that, the dizziness may last for years. So associations, the, the head motion or change in the head position, a hearing disturbance, headache, a cognitive symptoms, relation to stress, these are all things that might play a role in dizziness. Uh, we look at a review of systems. We want to especially look at this, uh, vascular risk factors and ear surgery. We want to look at family history and then medication history or substance abuse history as well. Next slide. Good, thank you. So uh, now we're looking at uh, at special testing a little bit. Um, so we'll start off with saccades, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so these tests are not 100% specific, however, they'll help us to determine areas of need. So the, the pencil and the nose is in the same plane. Um, and what does that mean? Essentially, you are moving, um, you, you hold the pencil out at arm's length from away from the patient and you're moving the pencil in different directions. And so you're not uh, rotating the pencil at all, you're not moving it in a circular manner. Um, you essentially just want to move the pencil either horizontally or vertically. Okay. And you want to check to see that uh, saccades are moving, are, are properly occurring uh, with this patient. So that if, when you move the pencil faster than they're able to pursue, and you are actually seeing the patient, uh, patient's eyes jump in space. Uh, smooth pursuits. Smooth pursuits are um, the ability for, as I mentioned earlier, for the eye to, to track objects. And so you're going to keep the pencil, you'll have the same pencil, and uh, you'll move the pencil in smooth circles. So that means, for example, um, if the, the pencil is 12 to 14, inches away from the nose, and you're moving the pencil in uh, a large circle around the, uh, the uh, perimeter of the head, smooth circles. Okay. Um, the vestibular ocular reflex, so we're looking at horizontal canals. Uh, so you're going to look for eye movement, uh, body sway, uh, you're turning your head essentially side to side for the horizontal vestibular ocular reflex, and you're looking up and down for the vertical vestibular ocular reflex. Okay, so the way we test the horizontal vestibular ocular reflex is uh, by keeping the patient's arms length, uh, keeping the patient arms length away from the wall. Um, you essentially uh, put a letter on a plain background. You flex the head to 30 degrees, and have the patient turn their head back and forth. So this is where we're going to try and get a little bit active if we can. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to tell what everybody's doing, but if we can, uh, we, I'd like to try this with everybody. So the, my thought was to, and please do let me know, you can unmute your mics if you need to let me know if this is going to work or not going to work. But essentially, I'd like everybody to um, stand up. Uh, the team leads at each 
hospital, if you can, on a particular piece of paper, just write um, a, the letter B. And let the letter B be two inches in height. You want to put that up on the wall. And we'll pick, we'll pick somebody, pick one volunteer. Make sure that the letter on the wall is not too high because we need the person to be able to flex their hand 30 degrees while looking at the letter and then turning their head side to side. So keep whoever your, your volunteer is, uh, make sure that the letter is properly lined up. Once you are um, in the correct position, uh, you want to flex the patient's head by 30 degrees. Uh, they will be essentially arm's length away from the letter. You're going to tip the head down while looking at the letter and then rotate the head side to side for one minute. So I'll give it, uh, I hope we're, we're all ready to begin. I'll give it one minute. And then I'll, if you don't mind, you, could, you can come back to me and tell me um, how many head turns each person was able to do. Okay, kindly repeat instructions. Okay, so uh, pick a volunteer, Nairobi. On a piece of paper, write the letter B, which would be two inches in height. Fix that piece of paper to the wall at a height that allows the patient to flex their head in 30 degrees while standing. While standing. patient one arm's length away from the wall. Once they are one arm's length away from the wall and able to focus on the letter B with their head flexed by 30 degrees, they can begin turning their head side to side. Not all the way, but I would say probably uh, 30 to 45 degrees to each side max. And you want to count how many times the person can turn their head side to side in one minute.
guys are at. Or I can talk a little bit about the I'll talk a little bit about the horizontal vestibular walking reflex. So what you're doing is you're essentially looking for this person's ability to keep an eye on this letter while turning their head back and forth. So now you might uh, see different symptoms while they're turning their head back and forth, like dizziness. Uh, you might uh, find the inability of a patient to fixate their gaze on uh, that particular letter B while they're turning head back and forth. So while you're doing this testing, you want to be close to the patient as much as possible and or have a chair ready for that person in case they need to sit down. You only want to do this for, for 60 seconds max. If the person starts to feel dizzy at any point in time and needs to sit down, you can discontinue the test and uh, indicate that in your notes. So average responses are the ability for the patient to turn, turn their head side to side once per second for 60 seconds, so over one minute. You'll count the head turns, and it, once the person looks right and then left all the way through, that's considered one turn. Um, and so if they do it 60 times or more, that's a well-managed and well-balanced vestibulo-ocular reflex, or HBOR, horizontal vestibulo-ocular reflex. If they're doing it for less than 60, um, then you're looking at a deficit. Um, so between 45 and 60 would be a primary deficit. Less than 45 would be, um, you know, a secondary or maximal type of a deficit. Shall I move on to the next one?
join that, so welcome. So, uh, Patuma, we have we've moved to the preliminary slides. We're now looking at uh, examination and diagnosis or special testing in the vestibular system, and we're talking about head thrust. So we did uh, horizontal and vertical. Okay, now we're uh, going into dynamic visual acuity testing, but before we do that, uh, I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about nystagmus. Okay? We have two types of nystagmus, and that is when uh, nystagmus, as I mentioned, is when your eye essentially needs to snap back to focus uh, once you've moved in a particular direction. So you have a spontaneous or gaze evoked nystagmus. A spontaneous nystagmus is obviously when the patient is uh, just sitting there and their eyes are snapping. They might move slowly to the left and snap back to the center, or they might move slowly to the right and then snap back to center. That's a nystagmus. So um, if it's a peripheral lesion or peripheral issue uh, that's causing the nystagmus, then that usually indicates an acute issue. And you'll see the nystagmus in a horizontal and or torsional manner. That's what that means. The eyes are moving back and forth in a horizontal and slightly rotating manner when they snap back. Um, and that's it. That's a peripheral lesion. If it's a central lesion or a central issue, um, that usually will be to either an acute or chronic issue, and it's vertical. The nystagmus is vertical. The eyes are snapping up and down. And that's a central lesion. So peripheral lesion, horizontal, central lesion, vertical. Mike is as still as possible. Um, so we have the spontaneous uh, nystagmus, of which within the spontaneous we have the peripheral and the central lesions, and then we have the gaze evoked nystagmus. Okay. Um, and so to test this, the gaze can be held either left, right, up, down, that 20 to 30 degrees from the center to resting position. So, for example, if you want to look at page 59 of the handout, it gives a nice clear uh, breakdown of the types of nystagmus. Um, and so in this case, the therapist is holding the patient's hand in a particular position. And eyes so uh, you can either move that fist 20 30 degrees left right up or down from the center position and you can just take a look to see that there's no snapping of the eyes this is the gaze you now we'll move into dynamic visual acuity testing where first you will test visual acuity uh, statically and then dynamically. So using the vision chart, um, you'll have the patient sit in front of the vision chart um, at the standard distance, which is usually two arms length. You want to check to see which row they're able to accurately note. Okay. The lowest line, which, which the patient can accurately give you the details of or name the letters correctly. Um, you are going to then rotate the patient's head back and forth. That's a passive rotation of the head at, at 2 hertz, which is essentially 2 rotations or 2 oscillations per second. With the neck flexed at 30 degrees, uh, they should essentially be able to read the same line as when the head is still. Or, as I mentioned, they can go one line larger if the head is moving. And it indicates a vestibular deficit if the patient is unable to uh, see two levels uh, above or larger levels. The two levels uh, would indicate a unilateral or one-sided deficit, and four laterals would indicate, four levels would indicate a bilateral deficit. Ali, this is Salima. I think you've um, floated away from the speaker. It's hard to hear you. Okay, is, is this better? Yes, that's much better. Okay, thanks. Okay, 
So during this uh, dynamic visual acuity, you can have the person's head turn um, left to right or even up and down. Okay, so it's using rapid rotations of the head. So if you are moving your head horizontally using side bending, you are essentially accessing or biasing the superior vestibular nerve. Uh, if you're having head nods, if you're doing up and down, you're biasing the posterior or anterior canal and you're looking into the inferior or you're accessing the inferior vestibular nerve. And so you want to use unpredictable head thrusts and um, uh, as I mentioned using the, the vision chart. During this uh, dynamic visual acuity, you'll note either a hypoactive or a hyperactive VOR. Okay, so a hypoactive, and this is also that you'll, you'll also note this during uh, the head thrusting. You might see a hypo or hyperactive vestibulo-ocular reflex. So a hypoactive vestibulo-ocular reflex would mean that the eyes travel with the skull during the thrust. So you're turning the patient's head, for example, to the left and right, and all of a sudden you thrust to the left. That means the eyes then travel to the left despite being asked to focus on your nose or the letter B behind you. And then what happens is the eyes will then snap back to the location that you identified as being important for the patient to focus on. So that's a hypo. So you've turned away from the object that you're staring at, and then the eyes have to snap back because it's hypoactive, so your brain then has to make up for uh, its inability to stay focused on the object. So a hyperactive vestibular ocular reflex would mean that the eyes overcorrect. So they're going in the opposite direction. That is one that I'd like everybody to try on their own. What we're going to do this is a testing of the vestibular ocular reflex suppression. So you're sitting down, the patient clasps their hand in front of their head and put their thumbs up. your eyes on the thumb as you rotate the whole complex head, arms, and trunk. What you're doing is you're blocking out everything in the background and keeping your eye on the foreground or the thumb. And if the patient is unable to do that, that indicates a CNS lesion. So the next one is a positional dizziness assessment. Then, yo, can you hear me? I'm, I'm trying to the mic as as steady as possible. The it's almost I'm almost have the microphone in my mouth. Can you can you hear me? Lima? It's quite fuzzy uh, and it's very soft. It was almost better when you were just reading off the thing. Maybe try moving it away. I don't know. It just seems muffled. Okay. Um, hang on one second. See, right now that was really good, whatever you just did. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not touching it now. <laughs> so it's okay? This is much better. Okay, fine. All right. So now we're in the, um, the special tests. Okay. All right, Nairobi, I'll stay right here. Um, so now we're looking at uh, a positional dizziness assessment, okay? And so, um, thanks, uh, Peter and Dar Salaam, we got it. So, um, 
uh, we're looking at uh, testing for BPPV. And so what exactly is BPPV? Uh, it stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, and uh, essentially it means that the autoliths or those calcium carbonate crystals in the ampullae of each semicircular canal, those have the ability to be dislodged. And if they're dislodged, then what they're doing is they're moving around the gel-like fluid and disturbing those hair cells in each semicircular canal. So, for example, um, you might move in a particular way, dislodge those quote-unquote calcium carbonate crystals or autoliths, and those would then be stimulating the ear cells while you're not even moving. You moved again, Ali. Again? Now you're back. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to uh, tape this thing into place or something. But um, So we're all going to try this, or even if we want, we can have uh, one person try this, uh, where one person is the patient, the other person is the examiner. So I'd like to recommend that whoever is the examiner is somebody who's done this before. Okay. Because we're going to start off by looking at um, testing for the posterior semicircular canal. And just as a quick review, we're looking at three semicircular canals, anterior, posterior, and horizontal. Okay. So let's say if we're testing uh, the left posterior semicircular canal, you're going to have the patient sitting on a treatment table in long set. You're going to position the patient so that when they are supine or laying on their back, their head is off the table. Okay. So as you're long sit, you're going to rotate your head to the left by 45 degrees. You'll extend the neck back by 20 degrees using your own hands, using the examiner's hands. And you want to quickly lower that patient down into supine. So the therapist's hands start pointing downward at the ears for the best position. So, you know, your fingers, uh, you can see in the picture there, the fingers are down at the base of the scalp, the thumbs are up at the top of the head as you lower the person down. When you lower that person down, you're going to take a look at nystagmus. Okay, so you've turned this person to the left, you're testing the left posterior semicircular canal, um, and you're checking for nystagmus. Okay, so we have two types of BPPV. We have a canal lithiasis and a cupulo lithiasis. Okay, canal lithiasis we can fix. Cupulo lithiasis is harder to fix using these treatment um, options. We have to go back. the autoconia are flowing free and we can essentially use this method to, to get them back into the right place by rotating the head essentially and we'll, we'll get into that uh, but in the cupulolithiasis the hair cells are essentially stuck to the gelatinous cupula um, and that is something that as I said we have to teach compensatory mechanisms for so in the, so how do you tell the difference Analysis, um, you will see an onset delay of nystagmus. Once you lay the patient down, it'll take a little while, somewhere between three to four seconds, for the nystagmus to onset. Meanwhile, if it's a cupulolithiasis, that nystagmus will happen immediately, and it will continue without decrease. Meanwhile, on the canal analysis, it will subside. How about now, Slima? How about now? Uh, you're still. It was better before. How about it just now? Moves. It 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 moves when you move. We can tell when you move, and then it just it's very low. Okay. How about now? That is perfect. Okay. So I can continue speaking. 
as long as you don't move. <laughs> All right. Um, Shalima, um, Dara has a question for you. I don't see it. Did you record? Yes, I've recorded. You've drifted off again. Okay, great. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So we we looked at the posterior semicircular canal, and now we'll look at the horizontal semicircular canal. Okay. So in this, for the horizontal semicircular canal, the patient is already laying down, but the head again is flexed to thirty degrees. We're going to quickly rotate the head towards the involved side. You look for symptoms. And then you can rotate to the other direction once ready. So what does a geotropic and ageotropic nystagmus mean? It means are you having the Okay, I got I got the note from Darslam, so I'll I'll re explain it. So um so Tuma, what we're we're talking about uh BPPV which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is essentially the movement of little crystals in the inner ear, which although you may not be moving, those crystals are still stimulating the, ear, the hair cells in the inner ear, um, making you feel like you're still moving when you're not. So this is a testing for that. the testing and it's, it's going to be hard for our, for for, Tuma, for our, uh, me to go back and explain but essentially we're looking for nystagmus which is a beating of the eye so, so you have the nystagmus in, in one direction a slow movement in one direction and then a snapping back in the opposite direction um, and a quick review for everybody we have two types of nystagmus we have the spontaneous or gaze evoked So we'll go to the next slide. Andre, you can go to the next slide. Okay, great. Uh, so vestibular rehab. So finalizing a diagnosis. Um, so at this point, we need to be able to create a hypothesis as to what is the problem. And so we'll, we'll try and run through a case study as much as possible, and then we'll go through some treatment options. So the example one is we're having a unilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction. Okay. So let's break that down. What exactly does that term mean? Unilateral, one side. Peripheral, we're looking at peripheral versus central. So if it's peripheral versus central, what, what exactly does that mean to us in this case? It means is the issue in the brain or is the issue in the ear in this case? Um, and it's a, so it's a vestibular hypofunction. That means that that ear or that side of the vestibular system is essentially sending less signals or is less stimulated uh, than the opposite side. So your brain is receiving less input, for example, on one side compared to the other. What are the possible pathologies of this issue? Uh, we said either a viral or bacterial infection, the labyrinthitis, which is the local inflammation of the uh, labyrinth, or hypoxia. Uh, it could be a status post neuroma resection and so a neuroma resection is um, the removal of a, of a tumor on the auditory nerve. So it's a nerve-based tumor and the cutting away of that sometimes uh, as people age they can develop a tumor on the 
auditory neuron that sometimes needs to be cut away in order to allow for transmission of sound. And so that post that surgery, uh, you may have some diminished uh, vestibular function or vestibular hypofunction. Barotrauma. Uh, what is barotrauma? It essentially is pressure trauma. So either you may have gone too far underwater and scuba diving and not properly adjusted pressure. Uh, some people don't properly adjust uh, their pressure. They may have a baroreceptors which are not as sensitive. So going up in a plane sometimes causes a little bit of vestibular hypofunction. You might feel dizzy after you come out of a plane or a concussion getting hit in the head. Physiology is an imbalance in vestibular input from the right and or left labyrinth. Okay. Now we'll, we'll get into a little bit of treatment options. Next screen. So canal lithiasis. Um, this is, as I mentioned, you know, something that we feel that we can we can correct pretty quickly. And so if you're having this canal and diastasis in the horizontal canal, you want to use channel to be positioning treatment. So you will lay the patient on their back with the affected ear down. So you've done your testing. You tested on the left. You did the Dick's hole like maneuver on the left where you rotated them to the left and then lean them back and look quickly at their eyes to see if there's any nystagmus. Then you do it on the right and you lean them back while looking to the right and you determine, okay, is my, I have a horizontal issue on the right or the left and you determine what exactly is going on. You've taken a nice long history so you've got an idea of what exactly is causing the dizziness and all of the issues. So in this case now you're going to provide the treatment. Um, uh, you will turn the patient to the side that is affected and have that affected ear down and you wait until the dizziness stops. Essentially all you're doing is you're rolling the head to the affected side. Okay. You're doing a 90 degrees neck rotation and again you wait until the dizziness stops. You roll to prone, wait until the dizziness stops. You roll to side lying with the affected ear down wait until the dizziness stops. And so what you're doing is you're rotating the patient's head and waiting until the dizziness stops, which means that the, those crystals which are moving in the ear have stopped moving when the dizziness stops. And so you're essentially using the rotation of the head to realign these calcium carbonate crystals. And you can do this once, twice a week for a patient. Now cupulolithiasis. Now, that's where we mentioned that the ear, uh, the hair cells in the inner ear are essentially stuck to the cupula. So, we're going to have the patient supine. We'll have that person roll their head quickly as much as possible. Uh, you want to do five to ten seconds in each direction. And that is essentially trying to unstick those hair cells just biomechanically unsticking those hair cells. Now this is not as effective um, as the canal lithiasis or the cannula to be positioning treatment. Not as effective. Agreed. So Peter says that uh, it's an interesting maneuver and it works like magic and it really does. Uh, patients feel like you've cured them um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and they really do appreciate uh, this type of and it does work. So something to practice on. Uh, you know, and I do apologize for the microphone if it's not clear. Uh, you know, so today's um, webinar is meant to be an adjunct to the MedBridge education. So they went into it in, in far, far, far more detail than I've been able to go through it over the past uh, hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes. Um, so please do review you know, the handouts, please do look at the videos. If you're finding the videos boring, there's a lot of wasted time sometimes you know, in the videos if you want to just cut through. Um, you can go
go straight to the examination and our treatment videos. Those would be very helpful. Okay, so we've treated the horizontal canal. Now we're noticing there's a deficit in the posterior canal based on our testing. So the, if we're testing the um, posterior canal, we're doing the Dix Hall Pike. Okay, we're going to turn to one side, <coughs> lean the patient back, excuse me, <coughs> and, and we've noticed that there's a deficit in the posterior canal. So we're going to extend the head by 20 degrees, and using the canal, um, canal analysis repositioning treatment, we're putting the patient into Dix Hall Pike or Hall Pike Dix position for the affected ear with the head extended and off the table. So if it's left, we're rotated left. If it's right, it's rotated right. And all you're going to do is keep this keep the patient in this position for one to two minutes until the dizziness has fully subsided. Uh, then you roll to supine and have the patient lay there for 30 seconds. Rotate neck to 45 degrees and hold that for 45 seconds. And so that's rotating toward the side. So if it's a left issue, you're rotating towards the left for 45 degrees. Then you're rotating 90 degrees all the way so that the person is essentially looking all over their shoulder while lying down. And you're going to hold that for 30 seconds going to roll to side lying. So what you're seeing here is that the head movements precede the body movements. The head movements precede the body movements. So we are we roll the supine, then we rotate our neck, for example, to the left. We rotate our neck further to the left, then we move the body to the left. Then we move the body all the way lying prone, and then we can help the patient sit up with a chin tuck. If it's a cubital lithiasis affecting posterior canal, you can have the person sitting in a chair or sitting um, on the edge of a bed. Extend their head by about 20 degrees and rotate 45 degrees away from the affected side. Go to side lying on the affected side. So let's say my affected side is my right. So I've turned to the left. I'm looking left, and I'm going to lie down on my right side, and I'm going to wait 30 seconds. Then I will sit back up, turn my head away, and quickly side light to the opposite side. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to bias the posterior canal and shake it up, unstick those hairs. Before we wrap up, um, you know, I wanted to uh, just quickly talk about a few of the things that we haven't touched base on. So, a quick wrap up for the BPPD side. If we want to test the posterior semicircular canals, we can test it on the same side by turning to that same side and then laying back down. If it's horizontal, we have the person laying down and turning their head side to side, very straightforward. Okay. There's something I didn't mention earlier um, uh, with regards to determining is a nystagmus being caused by vestibular issues or a, a central issue, so peripheral versus central. We can do uh, something called hyperventilation to help us figure that out. So, and that was mentioned in one of the videos, whereby if you have the patient take a breath, one breath per second for 40 seconds, and you check to see if there is a nystagmus. That, and if there is a nystagmus, that indicates a possible unilateral vestibular hypofunction. 
another way to check for nystagmus is by hyperventilation. How about balance and postural control testing? This was something that I had mentioned earlier with the sensory integration or sensory organization. Um, in the MedBridge handout, they call it, uh, I think they call it CTSIB, clinical test for sensory imbalance. Clinical test for sensory imbalance. And so, you know, you start off with the patient standing on a firm surface. Step one is firm surface, eyes open. Second step, firm surface, eyes closed. Third step, soft surface, eyes open. Fourth step, soft surface, eyes closed. Okay, so what you're doing is you're biasing particular systems. If you're on a firm surface with eyes open, you're getting input from, from the ankles, knees, hips, back, all the way up. And your eyes are open, you're getting visual input too. You're getting sensation from both proprioception and vision. Once your eyes are closed, you may be sitting, standing on the same surface. You haven't adjusted the surface, but you've closed your eyes. So now you're balancing your proprioception. Or I should remove the word balancing from that comment, but uh, now what you've done is you, you remove the visual input and you're forcing your body to more pay attention to its own sense of balance from a vestibular standpoint and or input coming in from the ankles. That's with your eyes closed. Once you're on a soft surface, you're again biasing the body away from sensory input from the lower extremities, whether it be feet, ankle, knees, hips, back. Once you're on a soft surface, with your eyes open on a soft surface, this is step three. Once you're with your eyes open, you still have the visual input and once you're on a soft surface with your eyes closed, that's step four, you've essentially removed all visual input and all proprioceptive input, forcing the body and the brain to pay attention to what's going on in the vestibular system. So step four is the most um, vestibular biased test of them all. Okay. And the last test is something called the step test or the few or the Fukuda step test. It's named after the gentleman who created the test, or it might even be the uh, lady who created the test. But the test essentially works by having the patient, and if we can end off with this, um, I think this would be a good way to end our, our testing and everything for today. We can have one examiner and one patient. So two people stand up and clear a little area, make sure you're in a clear area. Ali, just a second. What slide should we be on? I'm, I'm not on any slide. I'm just, uh, this is just the last discussion piece. Okay. Okay. So the last discussion piece here, it's called the step test. Um, and it's good for training. It's good for testing. So all you're going to do, you're going to have the patient standing up, have them close their eyes, and march in place for 50 steps, five zero steps. Okay, so the, that's why I mentioned it has to be in an open area so they're not kicking anything or tripping over anything. And you want to note the rotation of the patient. facing forward and once they're done by 50 steps, if they've rotated more than 45 degrees, that indicates a peripheral vestibular dysfunction. So this doesn't say anything about walking forwards or backwards or left or right. It simply only has to do with the rotation. So it's okay, for example, if they walk forward, it's okay if they walk in one direction, but it's more so looking at rotation. to the end of our presentation for today. I wanted to thank everybody.
everybody for the participation, for paying attention today. I'm this sorry for, for any microphone issues. I tried to make it as clear as possible. Uh, I'm open to questions. You can feel free to email me for questions as needed, or you can WhatsApp any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Please do review the material um, on the handout that Nishi sent. It's uh, uh, a long handout, but uh, which I think there's 159 slides. Um, some of the most <coughs> important slides are towards the end. Yeah, if you're able to look all the way to the, the end of that document, there are, I think, two or three slides which are very important. One of them is the algorithm that we used for dizziness, which is very important. Uh, and this is on page 124 of 159. There's, there's a BPPV flow chart. questions on and I'll be happy to work through that's page 124 and 125 of 159 very helpful as far as treatment goes you essentially want to use your testing techniques to provide your treatment so if you notice a horizontal vestibular ocular reflex dysfunction or hypo or hyperfunction. And again, that's a review. Is the patient just standing, head flexed by 30 degrees, looking at a letter B on the wall, and they're unable to turn their head side to side, fixated on the B for 60 seconds, and they're unable to turn their head side to side 60 times. You notice that's an issue. You can train them in that position. When they come back to the office, have them practice that. They can practice it sitting if they're, if they're too imbalanced or if they feel unsteady in standing. Um, if they're okay in sitting, you can move them up into standing. You can then change the surface. You can change the surface in standing while they're turning their head side to side. Obviously, that, ver that biases the vestibular system. That's horizontal vestibular ocular reflex training. You can do gaze stabilization while walking. You can have a patient fixate on the bee, have them walk towards it. You know, have a bee on the opposite wall, have them turn around and walk towards the opposite wall while fixating their gaze. If you want them to go uh, to work on their vestibular ocular reflex, have them turn their head side to side while walking. Have them be on a treadmill with a bee at the um, front of the treadmill. And have them turn their head side to side and try and focus on that letter B while on the treadmill, turning their head side to side. Obviously, guard your patient. Make sure the patient is okay. All of the sensory organization and integration testing. So you might have the patient eyes open or eyes closed on a firm or a soft surface. You can use those in training. So, okay, sir, we're going to have you stand on the surface for 30 seconds with your eyes open. Now close your eyes and stand on this for 30 seconds, and there's your practice. These are all things that we probably do anyway. Just giving you some ideas for treatment. And then, of course, we have the BPPV, next whole bike treatments. So, again, please just send any questions that you might have. I hope it was informative. There's a lot of information. I, I tried the best uh, that I could to um, uh, and, you know, try and explain all the information, any sort of the difficult things that are in here. Uh, do my, if you wish, we can. I'm happy to review at another time. You, you, I know you didn't miss the early portion. I'd be happy to review, and I hope that it was um, informative for everybody. I hope the information was clear. Um, and again, please feel free to send any questions. And we look forward to speaking with everybody again uh, on the next session. Just wanted to, to thank oh, Ali for uh, this very insightful presentation. If you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to send them our way. And you can also check on MedBridge for more there are many vestibular um, MedBridge uh, courses, and you're welcome to check those out as well. Very good. Thank you, Fauzia. And again, thanks, everybody. Thank you, all the team leads. Fatma, Fatuma, Mr. Maina, thank you for your help and for joining us, and we'll look forward to speaking with everybody the next time. Have a nice day, everybody.
Have a nice day, Ali. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.